All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like you to turn, please, in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 9. The book of Acts, chapter 9, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 19, is where we left off last time. Verse 19, and we're going to read down to verse 31. Acts 9, verse 19, down to verse 31. It says in verse 19, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying awake was known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. Now, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to uh, put a Bible ribbon or marker in Galatians chapter 1, because although we're doing Acts 9, we're going to be cross-referencing quite a bit. We're going to do uh, what Bible study method students call comparing Scripture with Scripture, which is always a good way of looking at the Bible. And just by <clears throat> way of outline, uh, we're going to look basically from the uh, second part of verse 19 uh, to verse 26, the first point of the outline is Saul at Damascus. And then from verse 27 through 29, we're going to look at Saul at Jerusalem. And then from verse 30 to 31, Saul at Tarsus. And we're basically looking at the early ministry and the early movements of Saul after his conversion, right? The early ministry and the early movements. And it's interesting, uh, many years ago, uh, I taught through the book of Acts in Ireland. And that was back in the early 90s. And somehow, I skipped this portion. I don't know why. I was teaching verse by verse. And I taught uh, the conversion of Saul. And then I skipped right to Dorcas. And I don't know why. But I'm so <coughs> glad that I discovered that uh, when I was looking at my notes and uh, I had to go back and do this. And, well, what a blessing it's been to my own soul. It may seem kind of random when you first read it, but I believe there's a lot uh, of truth here that will be beneficial to all of us. Remember that we saw last time that one of the things that happened after Saul was marvelously converted was that he was told by the Lord what to expect. He said, I've chosen you to speak and to suffer, if you remember verse 15 and 16 of chapter 9. He was chosen specifically for this purpose. The law said to him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So right at the beginning of his Christian life, he's told this ain't going to be easy. Yeah, you're going to speak for me. You're going to be my representative. You're going to speak to all kinds of people, uh, kings and Gentiles and rulers and 
you're, you're going to be speaking everywhere about me, but you're going to suffer everywhere for me. And so he was told right at the very beginning. In fact, from the outset, Saul had to taste for himself the very things that he'd been inflicting upon others. Because if you remember, what he was doing before he got saved was he was persecuting Christians. And now he gets to see what it feels like to have the shoe on the other foot, right? And, uh, you know, the Bible does say what a man sows, that will he also reap. And he sowed <laughs> abundantly and he reaped abundantly. Uh, he caused great suffering on others and he also suffered himself. As you go through the book of Acts, you'll notice that the persecution intensifies for Paul as he goes through. And uh, we won't take the time. We'll do it as we go through. But uh, you're going to see that he's going to be stoned and left for dead. Uh, there's going to be several plots on his life. Uh, uh, he's going to end up in prison in Rome. It's just going to be one thing after another. One time they tried to tear him limb from limb. I mean, he, it's just persecution, 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 all the way to the end of the book for Saul of Tarsus. What's interesting is he says to us in 2 Timothy, we'll be studying it on Wednesday night, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so, and it's true in a sense that um, there, there is rejection. There is, it's not an easy, there, there, is, there is a difficulty in following Christ. And actually the more, bold you are for the Lord, the more you suffer. I have a friend, he, uh, I've mentioned him before in our prayer times, he's an outdoor preacher in Edmonton, Alberta, all weathers, even in a snowsuit, he's out there 30 below zero preaching in the streets of Edmonton. But the LGBTQ community have latched onto him, and they go to all his preaching points and try to drown him out. He's had his amplifier stolen, He's had his cell phone smashed. He's had somebody try to stab him. I mean, he has gone through so much. And yet, in the process, has seen people come to Christ, including the lady who tried to stab him. Amazing, isn't it? And uh, so we need to recognize God never promised us it was going to be easy. And I think, in a sense, we've lived in an artificial bubble for a number of years in North America, and that bubble is getting really thin right now and may burst quite soon. And some of these things we're going to read in the book of Acts might be our personal experience. If we've not already experienced it, we, we most likely will. So I want to begin with Paul at Damascus. And uh, some have uh, subtly titled this section, Saul the Basket Case. I like that. <laughs> because he's let down the wall in a basket, right? So he really was a basket case. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, people said he was beside himself, just like they said that to the Lord Jesus. They thought he was mad. But we want to think about this. We notice in, in verse 20, it says, uh, after uh, he's spending certain days with the disciples at Damascus, and then it says, verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. So immediately, now you can imagine the shock factor of this man saying Jesus is the Son of God. Remember, he's, he's persecuting those that believe that. And he's gone to Damascus for that express purpose, to persecute those that claim that Jesus is the eternal Son who lived in the bosom of the Father always, right? This idea of the, the eternal sonship of Christ, that he is the eternal son of God. And, and so he preached that. It's interesting. It's the only time in the book of Acts that this phrase, son of God, is used and used by Paul. Now, it's used in Paul's epistles. It's used in John's writing prolifically, uh, but it's the only time you'll find it in the book of Acts. And it comes from this man. And why, what weight it bears coming from this man, a monotheistic Jew to the nth degree, to claim that Jesus was God's eternal son has great significance. And so we see that there was quite a response. Verse 21, it says, all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed them, which called on 
his, this name in Jerusalem. This word amazed, it's a translation of a Greek verb, and it literally means they were beside themselves. They were struck out of their senses. <laughs> it, it was, they just, we would say, they were blown away. I mean, they were just completely rattled that this person is preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. How did he come to that conclusion? Well, he came to that conclusion because if you remember, when the Lord appeared to him in glory on that Damascus Road experience, the first question he asked was, who is it, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Then he realized that he was indeed the Son of God and confessed him as such. And it's interesting, we think about this man, imagine all the scriptures that he must have memorized as a Pharisee. But he missed the key. Remember, the Lord said to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, but in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. In other words, you're missing the big point in the Bible. And once you get the big point, and of course, he's now indwelt and filled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 9, verse 17 tells us that. It says, when, Ananias, when his way entered in, said, Brother Saul, uh, Lord, even Jesus had appeared to thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost. And so this man now is all the scriptures that he's memorized. Suddenly the key has been given to him. Christ is the key to the scriptures. And then the author of the book that he has memorized and loved now is living within him and controlling him, right? Because the scripture is, well, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? And, and, and is that, that word inspiration, God breathed. It's the breath of God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so this book is, is the Spirit's work, right? It, it, men wrote, but the Spirit moved them. So this is the Spirit's work, and the Spirit's now living in him and making the book live to him like it's never, ever lived before. And so he's preaching. And I, I, I can imagine his preaching must have been something. All of this pent-up scriptures now suddenly making sense, and it's just flowing out of it as he's filled with the Spirit of God and teaching that Jesus is the Son of God. But it wasn't enough. He needed more instructions. Because it tells us in verse 21, but all that heard him were amazed. And of course, we understand that. And then it says in verse 22, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now, he's not just preaching now. He's proving in verse 22. He's proving without doubt that Jesus is the Messiah from the Old Testament scriptures. And I want to suggest to you between verse 21 and verse 22, something happened that you wouldn't get from reading the book of Acts. That's why we have to go to Galatians. So I want you to go to Galatians and I want us to see this same kind of time frame related by Paul in Galatians. So let's begin in verse 11. He says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews religion above many my, my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 
15 days. So what we see is that after he was saved in Damascus, he went to Arabia. And then from Arabia, he came back again to Damascus. And this time frame of Damascus, Arabia, Damascus is three years. We don't know how long he was in Arabia or you know how long he was in Damascus at first time. Second, we don't know the exact, but we know there's a three year time frame before he, after he was saved and before he went to Jerusalem. And during that time frame, there was a Damascus experience, there was an Arabian experience, and then he was back in Damascus again. And I want to suggest to you that perhaps between verse 21 and verse 22 is the Damascus experience. Sorry, the Arabian experience. So I want to think about Paul in Arabia for a moment. Because he had a, what we would call a backside of the desert experience. It's kind of interesting how men that God use invariably have to have their own backside of the desert experience. You think of Moses. Remember, he didn't go straight from the palace of Pharaoh to delivering the children of Israel. He had 40 years instructions in the backside of the desert. You think of John the baptizer, the great forerunner of the Lord Jesus, but, but he spent a lot of time in the backside of the desert before he began to preach. And then we, uh, we think uh, of Paul here, his Arabian experience. Three years in Arabia. Now, again, is there any significance in God taking this man from Damascus to Arabia. Let's go back to Galatians again, and I want us to go to chapter 4 for a moment. Chapter 4 and verse 25. Galatians 4, verse 25. <clears throat> well, let's just read um, from verse 22. He says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. From this, Agar is Mount Sinai, listen to this, in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, just bear with me for a moment as I try and explain this. I want to suggest to you that Moses got his revelation on Mount Sinai in Arabia, right? That's where the law was given on Mount Sinai. And, of course, the Galatians are enamored with Moses and Mount Sinai. And they, they, that's what they want to go back to, right? And Paul is telling us, I was in Arabia too. Right where Mount Sinai is. I was there too. And I got a revelation there too. I got a revelation from heaven, the same place Moses got a revelation from. He got a revelation concerning the old covenant. I got a revelation concerning the new covenant in the very same place. I got a revelation of these mystery doctrines. Remember the mystery teaching of the New Testament, things that were hidden in ages past, now revealed. Where did Paul get them? In Arabia. I believe that's where he got his schooling. And that's where, in the very same place that the law, which came by Moses, grace and truth, which came by Jesus Christ, was fully unfolded to the apostle Paul in the very same place. And now he comes back. And he's ready to preach it, the gospel of the grace of God, and preach it in all its fullness. And so it tells us in verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength. Well, he's been to school. <laughs> he, he's been uh, to, uh, to his seminary. He didn't get his doctor of divinity. He got his doctorate in the desert where God took him and revealed great and lofty truths to the apostle Paul that we Baskin to this day, right? We're, uh, we're not in Mount Sinai with gender's bondage. We're not in law. No, uh, we're Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, right? We're, we're enjoying grace in all its fullness. And where did it come? It came 
<clears throat> in the very same place, in Arabia, where Mount Sinai is. That's where Saul went. And that's where he received this instruction. Now he's back and he's increased the more in strength. He, he spent this time in Arabia. He's, he's had this wonderful instructions directly from the risen, glorious head of the church. And that's why in his teaching, he keeps saying, that which I have received of the Lord have I delivered unto you. Where did he receive it? He said, I didn't get it from men. I didn't get it from conferring with the other apostles. I got it directly from the risen, glorified head of the church that's where he got it so he says that which i received that's what i'm delivering to you and so he saw increase the more in strength and he confounded the jews which dwelt at damascus proving that this is very christ and after many and after that many days were fulfilled the jews took counsel to kill him and so we see already there's an attempt to destroy him their laying in wait was known of Saul. Somehow information had got to him, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. It says, then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. This is a very remarkable verse, verse 25. Notice it's the disciples. It says, took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Who are these disciples? The very ones he had gone to Damascus to arrest were the ones that were helping him to escape persecution he'd come to persecute them they're now helping him isn't that remarkable what a turnaround and what a turn you think of paul he went in blind to damascus and left in a basket pretty humbling experience isn't it this this proud arrogant pharisee is going with great fanfare and trumpets blowing so to speak to Damascus to arrest these Christians and he's led in by the hand of blind man and he's he's led out by a basket I mean you talk about a humbling experience could we say this not only does a man if he's going to be used of God need to get alone with God in the backside of the desert we've just been singing by the way do you notice that last song sweet hour of prayer any of you feel any difficulty singing that how often, let's be honest, how often have we spent one hour in prayer? Now, I'm not asking how many of you spent one hour reading your Bible. Because we, that's, that's easy, right? We, we like that. I mean, it's just fascinating reading the Bible. But one hour in prayer, 60 minutes, that's a long time, isn't it? When you try and spend 60 minutes in prayer, you just try it. See how you get on. You'll be looking at your watch after five. How long have we got left? 55 minutes, right? And yet we sing it sweet as birds, right? But you see, <clears throat> this man, Saul of Tarsus, well, what, a, what a, a man of God he was. And yet he, he had to learn in the backside of the desert. And then he had to be humbled. And this is a humbling experience, isn't it? To be let down from the city wall in a basket. He can never forgot it. it. It left an indelible impression on his mind. And, uh, and yet uh, it was important for him. He's going to be used of God. And so, again, we might challenge ourselves. Do we get along with God? Do we have our backside of the desert experience where we get along with God, where we can commune with him, where we can meditate on his word? And, and the problem is today we're living in the day of distractions, if you're going to get alone with God, don't take your cell phone, right? I know you might use your Bible on your cell phone, but don't. Just take a, a paper copy, you know, because you'll be tempted to look at something else. And just spend time alone with God. Listen to his voice. Hear him speak to your heart through the word of God. And, and I believe it will shape us and make us more effective servants. And then this idea of being humbled as well. It's so important. God, God only uses little men. Remember we said that his name was Saul. Later on, he's going to get called Paul. If you remember Saul, he was head and shoulders above his brethren, wasn't he? He was a tall guy. And Paul means little. And God says, I can't, we talk about name changes. I can't use you, Saul. <laughs> but I can use you if you're Paul. Because you're little in your own eyes. I can use you now, right? You've got to make us little before he can really use us. 
but too big for our own boots, but no good for God. And so it says that um, the disciples took him by night and led him down the wall in a basket. The very ones he went to persecute were the ones who helped him escape persecution. Which leads us to the second point in our little outline in Saul in Jerusalem. And again, this itself has great and significant interest to us, uh, even uh, though it may not at first reading seem that significant. Uh, but it tells us that when Saul was come to Jerusalem, I remember he left Jerusalem to go to Damascus three years ago. But he hasn't been back. Remember, he says it was three years before he went up to Jerusalem. So he went with letters on this mission with letters from the high priest, and then he disappears for three years. And now he's come back. But he doesn't go back to the high priest to report the success or failure of his mission. He joins another company, or at least tries to. You see, he's, uh, he's, he's in different circles now. He used to be in fellowship with the high priest, with those on Mount Sinai. Now he's in a different fellowship. A company that are, their names are written in heaven. And so he tries to join himself to them. And so it tells us that when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. You can understand their thinking, can't they? I mean, he's, what if he's faking it? What if he's like a Trojan horse, right? He's come in to find out who we are and where our movements are and all the rest of it, and where our meetings are, who our leadership are. What if he's a, and of course, in times of persecution, that's always a difficult thing, isn't it? Is there a betrayer amongst us? Is there somebody who's going to rat us out to the authorities? And so they, they're naturally a little bit nervous about this guy. I mean, he's, and of course, they're not alone. Uh, Ananias was a bit like that, wasn't he? When the Lord says, go to, he said, do you not know about this guy, Lord? I mean, this is a guy that's persecuting everybody. And so they were a bit reluctant to receive him into fellowship in the assembly. Which leads to an interesting point. And that of reception into the assembly. Do we just receive people who show up? It's interesting when you look at the New Testament, they were very careful about who they received. Because there are a lot of false teachers around, you see. So they had this kind of mechanism which was built in to kind of protect them, really. So that if somebody came visiting from another place, they would usually come with a letter, what we would call a letter of commendation from the brethren to say that we're in good fellowship and good standing and that we're not somebody who's a false teacher or not somebody who is a plant or a spy, but we have genuine credibility amongst the saints. And so we see examples of that in the scriptures, these letters. Uh, there's an example in Acts 18. Acts chapter 18. <clears throat> it says, um, verse 27. Speaking of uh, Apollos, it says, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, that's where the Corinthian churches were, it says the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. And so, so he went, Apollos went with a letter from the brethren. Right? So that they can relax, right? He's got a letter. So it's good. Like if we go visit another place and we intend to go and fellowship there, it's good to get a letter from this assembly. And it, it, these letters are not just some impersonal thing. It should be a kind of a character reference. This is a brother in good standing in the assembly, right? And so make it easy for somebody to write a letter about you, right? Make it easy on them, right? Oh, this guy's a pain in the, you know, I mean, you've got to be honest in writing a letter, right? This guy is trouble, right? We, so, but the problem with Paul is, or Saul, he couldn't get anybody to write him a letter. 
nobody would touch it, you see. So the Jerusalem assembly are saying, what are we going to do with this guy? How are we going to receive him? And so along comes a man who we're already familiar with, our encouraging brother. So notice it says, verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so somebody was found who would, if you like, act as Paul's letter of commendation. I know this man. He's genuinely converted. I, I, I will testify on his behalf. And, of course, everybody knew Barnabas well. He was such an encouraging brother, and they trusted him. They believed his word. And they, as a result of that, they welcomed amongst them Saul of Tarsus. And so he's now received into the assembly. By the way, I think I spoke not long, too long ago on Philemon. And again, Philemon was a letter of commendation. It's all about receiving this runaway slave into the assembly. Three times it says, receive him, receive him. If it was me, Paul said. Now, he understood what it was, how beneficial it was to have somebody to stand and, and testify on his behalf. And so he testifies on behalf of this runaway slave. And so all through the New Testament, there's this practice of letters. Uh, Romans 16, there's a letter of commendation right at the end there for Phoebe, our sister, who's a servant of the church, right? So it's good. That's the word deacon again. So uh, it's just an interesting how there is this practice in the early church. And, and again, it's interesting. It's not just a, some people say, oh, that's just a brethren thing. Have you ever heard any people say that, this idea of being care and reception? You know, it isn't. You know, in the Methodists, in the early days of the Methodist movement, to break bread, you had to have a ticket. And that ticket said that you'd attended all of the discipleship meetings. And if you hadn't, you couldn't break bread. They had a very restricted communion. You had to be in good standing. If you weren't, you couldn't break bread. By the way, do we believe that anybody could break bread? If you're in discip under discipline from your assembly, you would not be welcome to break bread here, I hope. Because part of what brings a person to repentance is that the privileges of fellowship are restricted to them. And if you're out of fellowship with God because of sin, you're not in fellowship with his people either, right? So, so you shouldn't be welcome, right? If you're under discipline. If you're a false teacher, should we welcome false teachers to break bread with us? No, of course we shouldn't. We have a restricted table. I know you don't, probably don't like that, but we do. It's not an open table. If you're living in open sin, you're not welcome to break bread here. Simple as that, you're not. And so we've got to be careful. There's balance in the word of God. Now, we're not trying to keep the Lord's people away from remembering him either. If, if you're a true believer with a true testimony and baptized, you're welcome. If you can prove those things, we're, you're very welcome right so so we need to be aware of this and so so that it brought out before us here that barnabas was willing to stand on behalf of paul notice what he says he took him brought him to the apostles verse 27 and declared to them how he had seen the lord in the way so he had a definite conversion experience he had spoken to him uh, he's heard from god he had preached boldly in damascus in the name of jesus and so it says he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. I just want to focus on this little phrase, coming in and going out. I like that. So he comes in amongst the saints. And then he goes out to the world with the message. See, all of us, there's a coming in and there's a going out, right? We come in to worship, we go out to serve. We come in together collectively to be built up, to be encouraged. And then we go out with the message of salvation to a lost and dying world. And Paul was doing a lot of coming in 
and then a lot of going out. I'm afraid we do a lot of coming in, but we don't do a lot of going out. That's a weakness, isn't it? We need to be coming in, getting built up, getting edified, getting equipped, and then going out with the message of the gospel. Paul was doing a lot of coming in, and he was doing a lot of going out. And so, again, just these little phrases, they seem like they're trivial, but they're not. There's great weight. There's significance in these things. And so he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And as he was going out, he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So he's, he's now going to the Grecians. That's kind of interesting. And he's speaking to them. Uh, his message. The, now, again, we want to think a little bit about this. He's, he's debating with the Grecian Jews. That's what the Hellenistic Jews. Remember we said in Judaism uh, at that time, there was uh, what we call the Hebrew Christians who were in the land. They were kind of from, you know, kind of spoke Hebrew. Uh, then there's those that Grecian Jews that have been living amongst the Hellenistic people of the world, the Greek culture. They have a Greek translation, the Septuagint translation. And, and so, but they have a synagogue in Jerusalem. And uh, Paul knows all about the synagogue because he used to be in fellowship in that synagogue because he is Saul of Tarsus, which was a Hellenistic Jewish settlement, right? And so when he came to Jerusalem, he would go to the synagogue where his countrymen would visit. And he had gone there when somebody called Stephen had preached there. Do you remember that? That was the Grecians. That was the Hellenistic Jews. And they had stoned Stephen. And if you remember, there was a young man called Saul. And what did he do? He held their coats while they threw the stones. So what does Paul do? He goes back to the very place where he had, if you like, collaborated in the first martyrdom of the Christian church. And he goes to those very ones that he used to be in fellowship with, and he preaches unto them, Jesus is the Messiah. Can you imagine the shock factor of this? <laughs> You know, again, we just read these things, but when we meditate on them, think about them, just astounded what that must have been like. Imagine that Saturday morning, because it would have been a Saturday, you know, Jewish Sabbath, that he shows up. We have seen this guy for over three years. And he shows up and he begins to speak fervently concerning the Lord Jesus. And so, again, as we, we read this little text uh, and consider it, meditate upon it, we notice that he says here, um, he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. We just love that. Just a, there's, a, there's no hesitation here. This is a bold proclamation about the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. He spoke boldly in the name, in the authority of the Lord Jesus, and he disputed against the Grecians. But we notice the Grecians haven't changed much since they stoned Stephen. It says, but they went about to slay him. So here we go again. We've already, we've already read just a few verses, and twice there have been attempts to slay the Apostle Paul. Once in Damascus, now in Jerusalem. And so it says in verse 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea. There was, we're going to get this guy out of here. They, Caesarea is a port city. We're going to put him on a ship, get him out as quick as we can. And they sent him forth to Tarsus. Now, again, we've got to read something else here. Because if we were just reading this, we might be tempted to think that Paul wasn't up for the fight. Because we, we know that he, he wasn't somebody to shy away you know, when people warned him about going to Jerusalem and all the things that he might suffer there, he said, let me at him, you know, like I'm ready to go and die, right? He's not worried about this. So why was he leaving at this point? What, what had uh, caused him to willingly walk away at this particular juncture? Let us look again at Acts 22 now, please. Acts 22 to get a little bit of uh, 
kind of a window, if you like, on this incident. We begin, begin reading in verse 17. Paul relates his story once again. He says, it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed, I will just close on me again for a second. Even while I prayed, it says in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. For they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy uh, martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And so the reason Paul left at that point was that while he was in the temple, he had this vision from the Lord, and the Lord reminded him of his initial calling. I've called you not to go to the Grecians with a message, but to go to the Gentiles with a message. And then he says, get out quickly, because they're not going to listen to you anyway. They're not going to receive your message. Get out of here quickly. And so simply... Put, he does exactly what the Lord says to him, and he leaves, and he goes down to Caesarea with the brethren, and their consent, their agreement, they knew, they brought him down there, they're with this, they understand that he's had this vision, and they sent him forth to Tarsus, so now he goes to Tarsus, that's where he grew up, that's where he had his education, and again, you can imagine, this is shockwave after shockwave, Damascus, they were shocked when he began to preach Christ there. Jerusalem, they sent him to Damascus. He was shocked when he preached Christ there. And now he goes to Tarsus, his own town. And you can imagine the synagogue in his own town on that Saturday morning when he begins to speak about the Lord Jesus. But nevertheless, he keeps on speaking, keeps on sharing this message. And I believe that many of the hardships that Paul endured were during this time period, there's kind of a time frame now from this point for about eight years where he disappears off the scene. We don't hear about him anymore until Barnabas goes to get him and bring him to Antioch. He's kind of disappearing from the plot for a little bit. But 2 Corinthians 11 tells us some of the things he experienced during this time frame. In 2 Corinthians 11, we have information that doesn't fit in the rest of the acts at all verse 23 second Corinthians 11 it says are they ministers of christ i speak as a fool i am more in labors more abundant stripes above measure in prisons more frequent in deaths oft of the jews five times received thy 40 stripes save one well we don't read about those in the book of acts thrice was i beaten with rods once was i stoned thrice i suffered shipwreck how many shipwrecks do we read about in the book of Acts? Just one, right? Three times, he says, I had shipwrecked. Night and day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen. There we go. Where was his own country? He's from Tarsus. Uh, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, painfulness, watchings often hunger thirst fastings often cold and nakedness and so basically much written there that we can't account for except in that eight year period and so what we could say is this guy spoke this guy suffered he spoke frequently he <clears throat> suffered but it tells us in verse 31 that even though saul had no rest it says then had the church's rest <laughs> because their main antagonist had got saved and the churches experienced rest, but they weren't complacent. We are all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. They were edified. They're built up. They're walking in the fear of the Lord. The, the, the fear of man is gone because the main antagonist has got saved. But they're still walking in the fear of the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God who had empowered them was now strengthening them. Maybe strengthening them 
in preparation for the next wave of persecution that was going to come their way. They've got a time of rest, and it's a time of the, the comfortis, the, the one who comes along to strengthen, to strengthen them. And it says they were multiplied. Now, just one more comment, and then we're going to close in prayer. And that is this, that in verse 31, it says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. It's interesting, we've heard about the expansion of the gospel in Judea. We've heard about the expansion of the gospel in Samaria in the book of Acts. We've not had any accounts of the gospel in Galilee. But what's the point? Well, the point is that Acts, although it's a wonderful history of the early days of the church, it doesn't give you all the details. There's a lot happening. We're just getting the main headlines if you like but god was working in galilee too the place where the lord jesus grew up was hearing the gospel and churches were being established there and so there's a great work what we've got in acts is a partial history but a marvelous history and we got a progress report again they were multiplied it's the third of seven progress reports that we're going to read about in the acts of the apostles maybe next time we'll talk about those seven progress reports but it's good to ask are we making progress are we growing are we multiplying it's good to ask ourselves these questions especially a year has gone by it's good to ask how are we doing spiritually do we know anything about the sweet hour of prayer do we need the backside of the desert experience to get alone with god and recharge our batteries and are we willing to speak and to suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus? Father, we just thank you for this marvelous conversion story and the ongoing impact, the shockwaves of this man getting converted that resounded really throughout the very Roman Empire. Lord, we pray that we might see some shockwave conversions in our day. People that would cause people to be beside themselves in amazement at what you do. Lord, we long to see this. We're thankful that you're able to save to the uttermost those that come to God through your son, the Lord Jesus, and his death, burial, and resurrection as the substitute for sinners. Lord, bless us in our labors, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, for his glory. Amen.